Very good. So this is the fifth lecture on operating system for wireless sensor networks, and we will see IBM Mode Runner today. Um, now this is um, an operating system which is actually quite different from TinyOS from what we have seen in the previous two lectures. It takes basically a completely different approach. So I think it's worthwhile to to looking at it. <laughs> Actually, we will not enter into all the details of this system. Uh, first of all, because of time. And second, because it is still in development. So it's not, let's say, a stable tool that uh, we can use. Okay, But it's, it's interesting because it, it takes a different approach with respect to TinyOS. So um, it's, it's very promising and we will we'll look at it. First of all, any question on, on the previous topics? No one. Everything was clear, right? Okay. So, let's start. So, what is uh, IBM Motrunner? Okay. So, it's well, an operating si another operating system for wireless sensor networks. Okay. But not only. So, it's not only the software that you use to program your modes. It is also a complete runtime and development environment for wireless sensor networks, meaning that it will give you the software for running the modes and the software for basically simulating the modes and managing the modes in your in your network. Okay, so it it uh, it can be seen as a complete solution. Okay, both for producing software for for sensor networks and managing sensor networks okay um, uh, look at it as a, an, an union for example between tinyOS and tosin okay so the two systems together one for producing software and the other one for simulating managing seeing what happens when you change parameters and this kind of stuff okay can you hear me actually because it's not working, is it? Well, it's not working, but I guess you can hear me, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, this uh, operating system is not a stable solution so far, okay? So, right now, uh, they are still working on that. I mean, EBM is still working on it, okay? Meaning that it's in a, a current beta version, okay? So, uh, do you know something about software versions like alpha, beta, release, and all this kind of stuff? Okay, so we are in the beta version, meaning that it's it, it can be used, it can be downloaded and used, but it's not stable. So, there are bugs inside it, there are tools that are not working properly, um, I mean, what EBM promises, it's not, uh, you know, fully, uh, fully maintained. So, um, we can use it, we can test it, we can try to run the examples, but still some features are not working, okay? So, that's why uh, we, I, I would not recommend it as a, you know, proper tool for developing application. Although it has some very, very promising points and we, we will see them, okay? Um, actually, now they are at this uh, beta 17 version, which is available only for uh, Linux 64-bit uh, systems. And since your virtual machine runs a, a version of Linux which is, which is 32 bits, I have loaded on it the beta 11 version, which is, you know, a previous version, so it has probably uh, even more bugs than the, 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 the one that is available now. Anyway, it's usable, so we will use it a little bit, okay? Um, anyway, um, it's, we will see, it's basically, um, well, the, the operating system itself is uh, a piece of software, okay? So it's, it's, you have the source code, and basically you can compile it on every system. And the managing part of TinyOS, so of Motrunner, sorry, so basically the part that you use for simulating modes and all this kind of stuff is based on the web browser. So it's basically a web service that you use on, on your local machine. 
And so it's basically usable on any system, okay? On Linux, Windows, and Mac, okay? That's why it's, it's useful, because it's very portable. You can use it um, on, on any operating system, any host operating system, basically. Let's see some very, very high-level key features, okay, of Motrunner. So first of all, and probably one of the most, uh, I would say, interesting feature is that um, the programming language that you use for producing software to be installed on the modes <laughs> is actually a very high-level programming software, for programming language, okay? You can use either Java or C Sharp, okay? And, you know, you, s you really see the difference now between Motrunner and TinyOS. In TinyOS, you have to use NestC, which is basically a dialect of C, which I would say is, it's not a very, very low-level programming language, but still, it has some complexity inside, okay? So it's, uh, I would say, a quite low-level programming language. Uh, instead, in Motrunner, you can use... Java and C Sharp, which are high-level programming language, object-oriented, meaning that you can use classes, you can add methods inside classes, and this kind of stuff. And it's, they, they are basically easier for you know, students and researchers that are approaching this field to, to, to be used. Okay? So this is, I, I would say, a nice point. The possibility of using high-level programming languages for you know, producing software for modes, okay? Um, so if w on, on one, yes? Yeah, exactly. In, in fact, we will see that this comes with, with a cost, okay? But very good point. Um, well, let's say, despite the, the, the fact that we can use high-level high programming languages, the hardware requirements for actually using Motrunner on a, on a mode are basically the same that we had for TinyOS. So very, very resource-constrained hardware. Like, for example, we just need 8K of uh, RAM memory and 64K of flash memory, which are requirements that you can find in off-the-shelf hardware, like the one that I showed you last time, for example. Okay, So it means that still we can use it on low-level hardware, such as the one that we will use then for deployments of sensor networks. And I've listed here four different uh, hardware platforms that Motranet supports. Um, well, you know, you, you don't have to, to know the names. Just know that these four are basically comparable to, for example, the Talos B platform or the Sky modes that we use in, in, in uh, Kuja, for example. Okay? So very, very low uh, you know, resource-constrained hardware. Uh, another nice feature is that we have, in TinyOS, a simulation environment, okay? which is graphically based. Okay? Again, it, this is nice. You have seen the difference between TOSIM and Kuja. Which, which one do you prefer? Between the text-based TOSIM or the graphical-based Kuja? Which one? Come on, don't be shy. Kuja, right? Okay, because otherwise I was leaving now. I mean, it's graphical, it's nice. You can move the modes inside, you can do, you know, see the LEDs blinking and this kind of stuff. So, so in Motrunner, we have a graphical simulation environment. Again, very nice. Okay, we will see it today. And of course, then we have other bunch of features like, you know, it's portable, it's scalable, meaning that we, we can use thousands of modes in a simulation, it's efficient, well, these are basically keywords that everybody says, basically, when they develop something, okay? Okay, my product is portable, scalable, and efficient, okay? So, <clears throat> let's see uh, 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 let's say, high-level picture of the Mot Motrunner system architecture. Now, let's try to do this exercise while, while we think about it and try to compare it with, for example, TinyOS, if you remember a little bit how TinyOS is structured. Now, at, at the low level, of course, we have the hardware, okay? So we have the mods 
that that we want to de deploy our software um, on. And of course, well, this was this is already here. Okay, and this is the, the the actual hardware that you use for your deployment, and it will be always there. Okay, no matter what operating system you will use later. Then we have uh, on top of the hardware we have. In, in Motrano we have what is called the HAL, so the hardware abstraction layer, which basically uh, you, you, uh, gives you the um, low-level software routines for accessing hardware capabilities, like turning on LEDs or sending a message on the radio, turning on the radio, and you know this kind of operation. So very, very low-level code, and in fact, it is uh, uh, a layer which is written in C or even assembly, so very, very low-level code, which directly accesses the hardware which is underneath, okay, and control the hardware operations. And again, if you compare this layer with, for example, TinyOS, also in TinyOS you have such a thing, okay? And basically in any operating system, either for PC, modes, uh, smartphones, you always have a layer which controls directly the hardware, okay? Now, the interesting things come on the layer on top of the hull, okay? Because, for example, if you think about TinyOS, you write application directly on top of it, okay? So you decide which components you want to use, okay? which basically means which piece of codes or which are exposed from the HAL I want to use in my application. So in TinyOS you say, okay, I will need the LEDs, I will need the radio, I will need this and this. And you will basically glue the components together through the wiring and then you're okay. And here we have the big, the very big difference of uh, Motrunner with respect to TinyOS. Now, in Motrunner, you basically have a new layer which is a virtual machine, okay? And so it's basically a piece of code which is always on top of the mode, so it, it always runs on the mode, okay? And it basically manages the hardware and exposes routines for being using from applications, okay? So, it's like having a almost proper op operating system on top of a mode which is managing applications for you, okay? While in TinyOS, you basically have only the scheduler function which is always running and you don't have a managing uh, entity which is actually managing the hardware, right? It's your code which manages the hardware, how you, you build the application, how you use the components. Instead, here you have a proper virtual machine, and we will see that this, the, the fact of having the virtual machine comes with a cost, of course, but gives you a lot of nice features that you can use. Next to the virtual machine, we have two APIs, so two basically interfaces that a programmer can use. And one is the runtime library, so basically it exposes all the operations that you can uh, do with your modes. And the other one is, well, the other two I would say are the APIs for the network, okay? So we have the APIs for managing 8.2.15.4 basically the first two layers, so the physical and the Mac layers, okay? And then we have also a network stack. So already, we have already uh, implemented uh, some nice protocols, like routing protocols and high-level um, software for managing networks of modes, okay? And we can directly use them. So on top of all these layers, you write the application, okay? And you can decide if writing it with Java or with C-sharp, okay? 
So what we you, you will do basically is to use the functions which are exposed by these three APIs here, the runtime library, the Mac layer basically, and the network layer if you need to use advanced functionalities. And you will implement the logic in your application. We will see examples of this. Um, questions so far? No, okay. Well, of course, the as you move okay, to the top layers of this stack, the complexity increase, and also the programming languages that are used to implement such functionalities are becoming, let's say, uh, more complex. Okay, so you start with C and assembly here, then you start, you know, using C and C sharp, and then it's object of oriented programming. So C sharp and Java. Okay. We actually don't have to worry about this, this, and this block. Okay, we just need to know how to use the APIs which are exposed by the these three blocks here. Okay, so what we can use basically. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see a little bit also how to what is let's say the process that produces an executable for a mode starting from a source code. Okay, this is basically what is called. Uh, compiling or, or you know compiling process in, in old systems or old Centennial as we have seen the compiling process here it's a little bit more tricky okay but I, I would say that the messages are the same so you start with the source code which again it's either in Java or in C sharp so you can start with one of the two and then you call the mode runner compiler, okay, which is uh, the, the the tool that produces an executable starting from the source code. We will see how to use it. Now, what the compiler does basically is to parse your source code, okay. It will do it will produce an intermediate representation which we don't need to worry about, and then it will produces basically a uh, bytecode, so uh, um, an executable which is basically a bytecode which is interpreted by the virtual machine and this is actually the same process that happens with Java when you compile a Java file in standard PCs so instead of producing an executable which, which is directly executed by the CPU you produce you produce a byte code, so basically uh, another code, which then the virtual machine can read and execute. Okay, so also in Java on standard PCs, when you compile a Java program, you have always a virtual machine which is basically executing the code for you. Okay, this is quite different from other approaches like C or C++. I don't know if, if probably the, the computer science guys here know something about Java and the difference between Java and C. I don't know if the telecom guys here know, know the difference. No, well, take it for granted, let's say. Um, so, let's say here you have your executable or let's say a debug version of the executable that you can use and when you compile, you also produces, optionally, depending on how you write the code, some sort of libraries, I would say, that you could use in other applications, okay? So, you can basically create a Motrunner application, which instead of being executed, okay, is used by another application, okay? and as you see, when you uh, start the compiling process, you can either use only the, the code provided by you, so the source code that you start here, or you can also merge it with other sources, okay? So coming from here, from the right side, and in this case, these will be 
um, more likely something that other guys have developed, like you know functionalities that you want to add to your application or tools. We will see an example of this. For example, when you have to print debug statement in tiny in Motrunner, sorry, you have to compile your application adding another functionality, which is the logging functionality. So basically you take your application and you compile it, telling the compiler that you want also the logging functionality. So the compiler will take the source code for logger and produce a, a bytecode which merges the two bytecodes basically. Okay? And you know extending this concept you can create libraries for your you know to be uh, then uh, developed okay or, or distributed is it clear okay so you can either compile your application by itself or compiling by you know requesting to add other functionalities which are already implemented okay now when we when the, the the compiler process terminates an assembly is produced okay so motrunner uses this word assembly to uh, refer to the application that we are developing okay so i would use uh, either application or assembly when i talk about motrunner it's the same thing okay so think about an assembly as a completed application which is ready to be run on the hardware, okay? Now, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, if you remember, we have seen in TinyUS that once you have compiled the application, you have to upload it on the mode, okay? And we used uh, the make install tool to take the application that we had compiled and you know load it on the hardware now in motrunner things are a little bit different first of all because we have the virtual machine okay so remember always remember that in motrunner you have the virtual machine which is always running on the modes okay so the virtual machine basically gives you something which is called the MoMA, which stands for Mode Manager, which is able to manage the assemblies that you want to load on a mode. Okay? And not the plural here. Okay? So you can decide to load more than one assembly on your mode. Okay? This is completely different from TinyOS. In TinyOS you have one application, you compile it, and then you load it on the mode. Right? If you want to change something, you have to, you know, in introduce the, the chain, the modification in your application, compile it again, erase the previous version, and then load it again, okay? So you have only one application per time. In Motrunner, this is completely different. Since you have the virtual machine, which gives you the mode manager, the MoMA, you can load more than one application at a time, okay? So you can decide to load different applications, and the virtual machine will manage them, okay? Now, of course, you have to have room for storing application, okay? So you have to, to make sure that the memory which is existing on your mode is able to store all the assemblies that you want to load, okay? So when you load an assembly on the mode manager, this assembly will remain there, okay? until you explicitly delete it okay and we will see that the mode manager gives you possibility to delete assemblies okay now you can imagine that this creates some problems right for example think about the memory management okay so you have to think about your mode as a little pc which has some you know read-only memory for storing the code and some random access memory for storing variables okay now typically the random access, access memory is 8k 10k okay on this mode so very very limited now what happens is that if you load multiple assemblies well sorry think about TinyOS uh, always 
when you compile an application in TinyOS, do you remember I, I've shown you that there's a, a memory footprint that appears after the compilation process, okay? That tells you how, basically, how much memory you are using, okay? And you have to make sure that the memory that you are using is not exceeding the actual memory that you have on the mode, right? Now, here comes the problem. You are loading more than one application on your mode, and each application will use uh, a certain amount of memory, okay? So how does Mode Runner manages this concurrency? Well, basically, it's the virtual machine that, you know, carries about managing this. So you have that all the random ac access memory that you have available is basically shared among all the applications, okay, all the assemblies, okay? You don't have to worry about it. It's the virtual machine that will manage the memory which, which is used by one or the other application, okay? Now, just uh, by thinking about this, you, you, you might think that the you know, amount of complexity that we are inserting in this system is growing a lot, right? We, are, we have to manage a lot of application, we have to manage concurrency in the memory, we have the virtual machine always running. You see, it's a completely, completely different approach from TinyOS, okay? So, um, we have the RAM memory, which is shared among all the assemblies, and of course also the read-only memory, the flash memory, which is used as what is called a cabin space, so to load the source code of the assemblies. Now, another feature of Tenue, of Motrunner is that uh, the virtual machine has its own garbage collector algorithm. Okay? Now again, just to, to you know, uh, have you on the same level, this is, the garbage collector is a feature which is typical of Java, Java-based system, I would say. So the um, the fact is that when you use um, operating, sorry, programming languages like C or, or C++, and you want to use a certain amount of memory, you have to allocate that memory, meaning that you have to tell the compiler that you want to use a you know predefined amount of memory. And you can do this statically by just by declaring variables, or dynamically in the, uh, during runtime by using expressions such as uh, new or malloc. Okay, so you are basically creating new variables at runtime. Now, since you are creating variables, meaning that you are um, taking some memory for do doing something, you also have to carry in. in you know, uh, traditional uh, systems to release this memory when you don't need it anymore, okay? So, you, you know, allocate memory by using new alloc or malloc, and you have to release this memory when it's not needed anymore by using, for example, delete or dealloc and these kind of routines, okay? And this is typical of C and C++ systems. In Java, they basically uh, invented this garbage collector, al collector <laughs> algorithm to, let's say, easy the life of programmers. So you can create variables, but you do not have to care about removing the variables, okay? So there's another, let's say, ghost uh, algorithm which is running and which determines if a variable that you have allocated is useful or not, <laughs> or can be removed, okay? Can be thrown into the trash into the garbage. And this feature is also present in Motrunner, okay? So since you have many assemblies that uses the, the heap, the memory, the virtual machine has this algorithm that checks the memory and see whether a variable can be, you know, deleted or not, based on the fact that it is used or not by a particular assembly, okay? Now, again, nice feature, but it comes with a cost. The cost is that we have an algorithm which is always running on the mode and always checking if the variables can be deleted or not, okay? And typically, this garbage collector algorithm is e executed when uh, the, the mode is idle, meaning that the assemblies are in an idle state. Maybe they are not doing 
particular tasks or they are just waiting for events to come, okay? So again, the garbage collector is convenient, but it's cost costly, okay? Um, so before going to the actual examples, a little bit of uh, general introduction. So as I said, we can use either Java or C Sharp, but you cannot imagine that we can use exactly all the functionalities that Java and C Sharp gives, gives to you, okay? Be this is basically because of they are quite complex, okay? And even, even if the, the Motrunner system tries to cope with complexity by porting some nice features of standard operating systems into it, still you can use you can't use every every tool that is inside Java or C sharp. So basically if you have a code that does something in Java, you cannot just literally copy and paste the code into Motrunner and and make it work. Okay. You have to do some changing of course. So you have some non supported features, okay? So you you can't use float and double that double data types. Okay, first very very big limitation. So how can we do you know complex processing? Well, we have to convert everything into mm -hmm. integers. Okay, so we have basically to what is called to quantize our data. Okay, we cannot. So we, we have to port everything into integer, but we cannot use 64 bits or longer integer arithmetic. Okay, meaning that we can we can't use long ints or long long ints these kind of variables. Okay, so the dynamic range of our numbers is very limited. Okay, other limitation. We can't use multidimensional arrays. Okay, so matrices basically. We can't use mat matrices. There's no support for threads, okay? So we don't have, you know, concu concurrent threads. Actually, if we want to have concurrency, what we have to do is to make, to produce more assemblies, okay? And then the virtual machine will manage this concurrency. We can't use Boolean arrays, don't tell me why, since, I mean, a Boolean array is, is probably the simplest thing in the world, okay, it's just a string of bit, but they decided that you can't use them, and you cannot use strings unless for debugging purposes, okay, so uh, there's no support for strings, so Java string, basically, but you can, uh, let's say, create some sort of string for printing debug statements. Okay, we will see examples of that. Okay. Questions so far? No. Yes. Okay, that's that's a good point. So the, the, the question is how does the virtual machine manages all these uh, concurrency between assemblies? I don't know. Okay, it's completely black box. It's, it's a completely bla black box. Uh, other, if you, you can read, if you go on the Motrunner website, you can read, there's a white paper that explains, let's say, the main, main features of Motrunner. And so they, they basically claim that the virtual machine is doing all this kind of stuff. They also claim that the virtual machine is capable of... Uh, setting the mode in the most energy efficient, um, uh, let's say, level for the particular time instant that you are in, okay? Meaning that the virtual machine is able to look at all the assemblies and see whether it can go into sleep mode or not, okay? And the virtual machine will also compute what is the exact wake up time for the, the mode when, you know, the, a particular assembly has to do some kind of action and all these kind of routines. So it's it's basically software, okay? It's it's how the, the virtual machine is implemented, it's it's a closed box. So it's uh, basically unaccessible, okay? You have to trust them. Now, in this table you see the main differences at least uh, from from an eye level point of view between TinyOS and Motrana, okay? So 
we have seen programming language, okay, low level for TinyOS, high level for Motrunner, the number of files that you need to produce and write for building an application. Well, in TinyOS, we have seen that we have to, to basically write three files, which, you, which are the module, the configuration, and, well, the make file, which is very, very short, but still it's needed. In Motrunner, you just need one, which is your Java or C Sharp source code for the assembly, okay? Of course, you, you can split it in different classes, okay? But the minimum number of files that you need is one. Uh, compilation process also. For TinyOS, it's ad hoc, meaning that if you want to compile for a particular mode and uh, for a particular configuration, meaning installation on the mode or simulation, you have to provide different keywords to the compiler. Okay? We have seen that, uh, for example, if you want to compile for Mica Z mode, we have to, to type make Mica Z. If we want to compile for installation, we have to write make Mica Z install. If we want to compile for simulation, it's make Mica Z sim and all this kind of stuff. For Motrunner, we have just one compiler that you know, uh, build the bytecode, builds the bytecode, which is which can be used then in any configuration that you want to use. Okay. Simulation interface, TinyOS is command line based. Motrunner is a graphical user interface. Other very very nice feature is the number of application that I can run in the simulation. In in TOSSIM, basically, so the Tiny, TinyOS simulator you can simulate only one application and if you need that the modes have different behaviors you have to differentiate that their behavior in the code. If you remember we have seen last time that if you need that a particular mode in your simulation uh, acts different from the other you have to check his ID basically his TinyOS node ID and embed in, in this if statement a particular operation. Okay. You can bypass, let's say, this behavior by using Kuja, where you can create nodes and uh, load on top of each node a different application. And also in Motrunner, you can decide to create different nodes and load on each node a completely different assembly. Okay, so this is nice because we can see the interaction which is <coughs> between different nodes in a network, which are run in a different application, for example. So Another very convenient feature of Motrunner, which is not present in TinyOS, is the real-time mode management. Okay? So we will see that in Motrunner, you can load and delete an assembly from a mode in real-time. Okay? You don't need to take the mode, attach it to your PC, and loading or deleting. Okay. You can do it in real time since you have the virtual machine which, which is always running. Okay, So it's, it's basically your operating system there. And you can also do it wirelessly. Okay, So without actually attaching the node to a PC. And this is very, very convenient because if I have developed an application and I have already deployed my sensor network and I want to change just one parameter, I don't want to take all the sensor and you know reprogram them and redeploy them. So I can just manage them on the fly with the mode manager. Okay. So what I will do, I will delete the <coughs> assembly and I will load on top of them a new assembly. Okay. Can you can you see the difference? It, it's it's convenient, right? Okay, so I guess that we can start playing with uh, with Motrunner. So um, we can maybe switch to the virtual machine if you have it, and we can start maybe playing a little bit with it. Okay. So I will use Java for all these uh, examples. Okay, but you, I mean, you can all if you are more familiar with C sharp, you can also use it. So it's uh, completely the same. Okay. <coughs> So as a first example, just as we did for TinyOS, we will see how to use the LEDs. Okay? This is basically one of the easiest starting points when we work with hardware like uh, the one that we have for sensor networks. Now, <clears throat> as I said, 
the minimum number of files that you need to build an application is one. Okay, so you just need your source code for the assembly. And in this case, it will be a Java source file. Okay, so the only, let's say, mandatory uh, library that you have to import in your Java file in order to produce an assembly is the following one com.ibm.saguaro.system dot asterisk well this asterisk mean then you want to load all the sub libraries which are part of this system library basically and as you can imagine this will contain the APIs okay so the, the interfaces for accessing to all the functionalities that Motrunner exposes to you okay it's Java so an assembly it's an, ob an object and in Java objects are called classes okay so it's basically a class in this case the application it will just turn on basically the all the LEDs of my, of my mode okay do you remember we have three LEDs and I will turn on all of them so I have this class which is called light start here and finishes here then I have a variable which is an integer which is the number of LEDs that I have on my mode and we will see uh, well if I know that I'm programming for uh, a mode that has three LEDs I don't need this variable we will see why and the starting point of each mode runner assembly is this keyword here static so the static initializer so the code that gets executed at the beginning is the one which is contained between the word static and these two brackets here. Okay. So this is the analog of uh, the tinyOS boot dot boot event, basically. Okay. So the starting point is this one. Um, what am I doing here? Well, first of all, I'm retrieving the number of LEDs of my mode. So I'm calling the LED dot get num lets function which is which returns an integer which tells you how many lets your hardware has and stores this uh, number into the num lets variable now this is needed because as i said the compilation process is one for all the hardware that you can use so if you decide to test it on a hardware that has three LEDs, num LEDs will be three. If you have an hardware which has only one LED, num LEDs will, will be one. Okay? But you don't have to recompile the, the, the application. And then I just have a cycle here, so a loop. I will loop on all the LEDs, so from zero to two. And I will set the state of my LEDs, of the LED I to 1, meaning that I will turn on the LED, okay? So this is the equivalent of uh, tinyOS LED call LEDs uh, dot, what, what was it, turn on, something like this, okay? So this function here will turn on the LED with the index i, so LED 0, LED 1, LED 2 in this example, okay? Now, let's try to write the application, compile it, and run it, and see what happens. So, let's go um, on the virtual box. You can open a terminal. Um, you have here in if you type ls when you open a terminal you have all the folders here in the home folder and there's a folder which is called mod runner which contains all the code so if you go inside it can you see on, on the screen do you want me to maybe enlarge the font a little bit um, where is it preferences Okay, is it better? Yeah, that, that projector is a little bit yellowish, right? 
anyway. Um, so you can try to enter in the mode runner folder here, and you have well the documentation, the, the actual firmware that you use for programming the nodes. But here in the examples folder, you have a lot of examples. You know, just as like as tiny as that you can try to run. Um, we will create these light examples here. Okay. <clears throat> so you have several examples already. <clears throat> And we will create the light, light example here. So first of all, let's uh, create a folder. Make the light, okay? So I'm basically creating a new folder here, a new example. Then you see I have the directory. I will go inside it, and I will uh, use gedit. To create a Java file, okay, light.java. Okay, so I have this editor. It's not the you know best editor in the world, but still it does what uh, it's needed. Now, what we have to do basically is to copy the source code that we have here on the virtual machine. Now, on my system, Control c on the, let's say, host system and Control v on the guest system doesn't work. De depends on the PC that you are using, it may work or not. But since it's very, very, you know, contained, I will write everything, which is actually easier. So, I will just say that my application here is in the folder examples.light. So... Um, this is a uh, keyword for, for basically telling which is the structure of your uh, folder directories in Java. And then I have to import uh, with this um, the, the package for exposing APIs, right? Is it correct? Yes. And then I can create my um my class okay which is the class light uh, i will skip the you know the text for commenting so i will just create my variables and let's okay and then i have the static initializer so so this the code inside these brackets will be executed, okay? So what I have to do is basically um, write a for from 0 to num let's, right? And each time I will turn on a different light, okay? Oh no, sorry, first I have to uh, get what is the number of flats of my system. So numlets is equal to uh, led.get numlets. Was it like this? Oh yeah, with this, which is capital. And then here I have to call led dot, let me see, set state. And I have to use a cast here to byte. Okay, this is because this particular function here wants this type of parameters. I want to set them to one, okay, which is the on state. Okay, I can save the file. Should be. Let's just double check it. Okay, should be okay. Anyway, the compiler will tell us if we have made some errors. Okay. Um, very good. So now I have my file inside here, this directory. Let me just clear the terminal. And what I will do... Okay, um, we are using the led API here. You have seen we have used the get num leds and the set state. The led APIs will all ha have has all, also other methods, for example, the get color, which will 
inform you on what is the color of a particular lead at a particular position and the uh, get state we will inform which will inform you of, of what is the state of the lead if it's on or off okay and we, I will show you later how to access the um, APIs and see what is the Motorunner documentation so when we test it now we have to compile it okay so <clears throat> in order to compile we'll, we will use the Motrunner compiler MRC okay which is a Motrunner program which compiles your uh, Java files or C, C sharp files for you Oh, this is not working. Hmm. Let me see. Wait just a minute. Well, that's quite bad. Well, let's hope. I don't think it will last. Let's see if I'm No. Okay, this one works. Good. Sorry for that. So, <clears throat> we have to use the MRC, which is the Motrunner compiler, and we have basically to declare which is, what is the name of the assembly that we want to create. So we pass this option, minus minus assembly equal to, and then here we can put the name that we want, basically, okay? Uh, the Motrunner convention is to use, uh, if your source file is called light with capital L, is to use light with, you know, small l here, and then put minus and the number of a version, okay? So it, you can start with 0.0, .0 and then go, you know, onwards, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so on. That's because if you load assemblies on top of a mod, you can always track which is, what is the version of your assembly, okay? So it's a nice way of keeping track of changes, basically. So let's call this command um, mrc minus minus assembly equal to light minus 1.0 and then I have to pass what is the source file that I want to compile, okay? which in this case is the light.java I will press enter it will take some time okay there's an error you see yeah because I was stupid so let's check of course I need this one variable Let's try again. Okay, so no errors now. Let me check the content of, of, of the folder now. As you see, I have my source code. And then I have three other files, SBA, SDX, and SXP. And if you remember for, from my slide, basically these are the product of here, this, this process here, okay? So the SDA is the file that you use for, deb that contains debug information, and the other two are basically the files that you use to load on your, on your assembly, okay? So now I have the assembly which is compiled. Let's see how to simulate it, okay? Let's move directly to the simulation part. So first of all, we have to start what is called the Motrunner shell, okay? Which basically starts all the Motrunner system. 
In order to do this, you have to type MRSH, which stands for Motran or Shell. You run it, and you see something has, uh, something appears. It, mean, it means that I can type commands here. But most importantly, if I now use the web browser and I go, it's painfully slow, and I go on localhost at port 5000, if I have the Motrunner shell which is active, the IBM Motrunner launchpad will appear. Okay, so this is basically the starting point of Motrunner. You have the documentation here, you can go inside the APIs and see what's, what happens. You have examples that you can run, you have, well, recently launched examples. And probably the most important thing is the dashboard. Okay, so let's go here. And the dashboard is basically the simulation environment. Okay, here you can create modes. Okay, like like in in Kusha, you can decide what type of mode to create, where to put it, and all this kind of stuff. Now you can do it either from here or directly from the terminal. Okay, and what whatever I write into the terminal will appear here on the dashboard. So, for example, if I want to create a mod, I will just type mod minus create here. Okay, this is the MAC address of the mod which has been created. And as you see now, I have a mod here. Okay, no name, I have given no name, I have given no coordinates of my mod. In, if you type help mod create, you can see all the parameters that you can set. And I have, you see here, three rectangles here, which are the LEDs, basically, okay? Now they are basically off, in off state. If you put your mouse on this node, you see all the assemblies that are loaded at this particular time instant on the node. And as you can see now, I have two assemblies, which are basically the Saguaro system, which is the virtual machine, and the Iris system, which is the hardware uh, abstraction, okay, which is different from for each mode that you create, okay. Now I want to load my light application, okay. So what I do is I type MoMA, which is the mode manager, MoMA load, okay. This um, command uh, allows you to load assembly on top of the mods and then I have to pass the name of the assembly that I have created which is light minus 1.0 okay now if I press enter the assembly will be loaded and executed okay so if I press enter what I will assume and expect is that when I come back to the dashboard the three LEDs will be on okay let's see if it, it happens okay loading done you go here you have the LEDs which are on, and now you see you have this assembly here, light minus 1.0, okay? And in the same, let's say, way, you can delete assemblies uh, or changing parameters of your mode and this kind of stuff. For all of these, let's say, how, how to use this, you can use the command help, for example, help mode create, and it, it will tell you you, you see all the things that you can do with mod create, okay? So you can specify the type of node to be created and uh, packet error rate, the name of the mode, the position of the mode, all these kind of parameters, okay? So it seems quite, quite nice. Um, okay, let's come back to the simulation. Sorry, to the slides. Sorry, just to oops, to complete here, if you go on the documentation here, well, you have several information on the Motrunner system. 
and you see here on the top right part you have the APIs so you can go inside here for example system APIs and you have all the classes that you can use for example this is led the led class and you have the you know methods that you can call and for each method you have the description okay so it's something like the tiny as documentation okay you have the radio class you have you know different timer class utility class different you know function that you can use for for building your applications okay now let's go a little bit inside these uh, functionalities that we want to use in, in order to to test them um, as you may imagine we need to see at least how to use timers and how to use radio messages and of course also how to use logging functionalities for printing debug statements and verifying that everything is working okay okay so I would say that these four uh, components LEDs, timers, radio and how to print are essential for any simulation or wire sensor method okay okay of course timers are very important in any embedded system because they they provides a, a, an API to specify a point in the future when the mode should perform something okay it could be anything it could be sampling it could be sending a message it could be going in sleep state whatever okay but we need a timer to keep track of the time uh, so of course Motrunner gives you timers and actually timers are implemented I mean IBM says that timers are implemented in a very efficient way, okay? So when you set a timer, the virtual machine will notice that the assembly has a timer, which is set, and will basically put the system in sleep mode and uh, put the wake up the system in order to meet the timer deadline, okay? Meaning that you don't waste basically cycles for the assemblies if the assembly has, has to wait for a particular time, okay? So, unless the assembly has to do other tasks between the starting of the timer and its deadline, the virtual machine will put the assembly in idle mode, okay? In order to save energy. Now, when the timer expires, so when the deadline is, is met, a callback function will, will be called, okay? So, this is similar to TinyOS event, the syntax is a little different. In TinyOS, if you remember, you have an event which is fired and you have to basically write your code inside the timer.fired event, okay? In Motrunner, you have to specify a function which you can call whatever you want and this function will be called by the callback when the timer expires, okay? So the easiest way to understand this is to have a look at, at one application. And what application we will be see? The Blink application. So an application which has a timers, a timer that continuously fires, and each time the timer fires, I will do something on the LEDs. Okay, just as like as tiny as what we have seen. Uh, so let's go here. Let's uh, let's close with Control C the Motrunner shell. Now, if you close the Motrunner shell, what will happen here to the dashboard is that you lost the connection to the Motrunner shell. Okay, so you will have this uh, error whenever you have the dashboard which is active, but you close the Motrunner shell from the terminal. Okay. Well, we can leave it like this uh, for now. So I will go back, oops, no, what did I do? We'll go back and I will check the Blink, Blink examples here. And let me just open the Blink.java source file. You have also a Blink.cs file, which is the C-sharp version, if you are interested in that, okay? But more or less, they are the same. Okay. So the blink.java source file is the following. So you see I have always to import oops, sorry to import this package here. 
I have my class, this time it's called blink, and I have a new object which is a timer object, okay? Um, I will have an integer which will specify for how long the timer should, should go. I have an, an index which I will use to trigger LEDs. And I, I have also the same variables as before, the numLEDs variables, to understand how many LEDs my, my hardware has. This is a stat static initializer, so the starting point. I will initialize the first LED to be activated at, at index 0, so it's the first one. Then I will get the number of LEDs by calling the led.getNumLEDs function. And then I will create a new timer object by calling new. Okay, this is a uh, keyword which is peculiar of Java and C++ basically, so I'm allocating space in memory for managing a timer. Um, I have a function here, all LEDs off, which as you can imagine turns off all the LEDs of the system, and it is defined here at the end of the static initializer, you can define function that you can use in your code, okay, in order to ease, ease a little bit the, the read, readability of your code. So the function all lets off just cycles on all the lets and put them in status zero, so it, it turns all the lets off. Then, after calling all lets off, I will set the callback for the timer, okay, so this refers to what I was saying you have to specify what is the function that will be called when the timer expires, okay? And in this case, you have this very, I would say, cumbersome syntax, but at the end, the important thing is that in these brackets here, you specify what is the, the function that you want to call. And in this case, you see, is uh, the blink function inside the blink class. Now, this is my blink class, and the blink function is, let me look for it, this one, okay? So what I will do, I will basically check the status of the current IDX. If it's 1, I will turn it to 0. If it's 0, I will turn it to 1, okay? And then I will increment to 1 the IDX. So I will start with the LED 0, then next time the timer fires I will move to LED 1, and so on. It's modulo num LEDs, meaning that this IDX will be doing 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, okay? And then I will set up a new timer, timer alarm. Now this is different from TinyOS. In TinyOS you have the call periodic function, so you can start a timer by telling, okay, look, I want this timer to fire exactly every two seconds, okay? In Motrunner you don't have such uh, functionality, so each time a timer fires, if you want it to run periodically, you have to start a new timer, okay? So I will set the alarm of the timer to this interval. And is, this interval is actually two seconds, okay? So interval is two seconds, basically. This is the syntax for converting ticks to seconds, so for having this system. Um, and then I have also another callback. Well, this is for when something happens on the system. You can also, you know, don't worry about this. But the, the, the logic is the same. You set a function to be executed, in this case on system info, when something happens. And if I remember correctly, this is when the system is shut down. Could it be? Or when the assembly is deleted, or something like this. So when you, you call something on the mode manager, this uh, system will, this function will be invoked. Anyway, let's try to um, load it. It's already compiled, so I don't have to uh, use the Motrunner compiled again. I will start the Motrunner shell. So this starts a new Motrunner shell, so on the dashboard the error message is uh, gone away, but I have no modes here, because I have 
basically deleted the first one by closing the motor runner shell and then I started a new simulation basically. So you have again to create a mode, okay, mode create. And then I have to load, MoMA load, blink minus java minus 1.0, okay. Go back on the simulator, wow it's blinking, okay. Very, very easy. Um, other interesting things of the simulator, well, if you go back here and you can close this, and you go on the net view, this basically gives you um, just as in, uh, in Kuja, uh, basically, you know, view of the system. Now this is not actually very useful for LEDs, it's more useful for radio messages. So when you have also radio messages which are going on in this simulation, uh, you will see basically that nodes are active or not, depending on their status basically, if they are receiving or transmitting. Now I have to say that this is quite buggy, at least on my system. I mean, I, I am hardly uh, able to use it. So you have a lot of bugs when you try to use this kind of visualization. Anyway, let's close this. Any questions so far? Okay. So we have like 20 minutes and so quickly we will see how to use the radio and how to use logger functionalities, okay? Now for the radio it's quite tricky because if you, again, as a com with making a comparison with TinyOS, in TinyOS you have this great, great uh, functionality which is the active message, okay? So you basically create a packet, then you select the destination, and that's it, okay? You don't have to worry about specifying the single bits in the single fields of the 802.15.4 Mac frame and all this kind of stuff. However, in Motrunner, you actually have access to the actually Mac layer of the frame, okay, and you actually have to specify the single uh, fields of this Mac frame in order to obtain the functionalities that you want, okay. So this is quite uh, important because you actually have to know how 8.2.15.4 works in order to use it, okay. So if you don't remember very well how to use it, well there's a bunch of slides and also on the Motrunner documentation that there's a refresh, let's say, on, on that part. Now when you create a frame in Motrunner, so a message in Motrunner, you actually have access to the fields of the Mac frame, okay? And if you remember from the lectures with, with Professor Cesana, you basically have uh, two beginning fields here, the frame control field and the frame control address field, okay? The sequence number, which is basically an, a counter which is incremented each time, and then if the frame control address specifies that you are actually using source addresses and destination addresses, then you also have to fill these fields here, okay? So the destination PAN address and the source PAN address, this is basically the address of the network, okay, it's a, an identifier of the network, and this is useful because you can have different networks operating on the same frequency, okay, and you don't want these messages to interfere, so you mark them with an ID saying, okay, this message is for network number one, and this message is for network number two. Network number one will you know, receive also messages that are stamped with the one uh, for network two because they are on the same frequency, but it will decide to not, you know, uh, not manage those messages, okay? And if you specify, for example, destination addresses, you, here you can specify, you see, either not to use addresses or to use short addresses or extended addresses, okay, depending on your application, basically. So remember that each mode, which is using 8.2.15.4, always carries three addresses. One is for the network, 
One is the extended address of the mode, so it's basically the MAC address of the mode. And then the MAC address, which is 64 bits, can be shortened into a 16 bits version, which is called the short address. Okay? Um, what happens is that when a message is received on Motrunner, these fields will be checked. Okay? Now, the frame called control field, if you remember, specifies if the, the message is a beacon or a data message, okay? Depending, again, on what kind of network you are using, if you are using a beacon-enabled network or not. Now, if the frame control field indicates that the, the message is a beacon, the, la the MAC layer will accept the message if the, the uh, source address of the network matches the current network address, okay, so if the network of that message is the same as, the, as my network, or if it's a beacon which is intended to be in broadcast, okay, so for all networks which are on the, that frequency. So I will accept a beacon only if one of these two conditions holds. If the frame control address also indicates the presence of destination addresses, meaning that I am actually using destination addresses, I accept the message only if the PAN ID, of course, match the destination PAN address, or it's a broadcast, so intended for all the networks. And of course, the destination address must match the mode's address, okay? or, again, if it's a, a broadcast address. So depending on how you set this field, these fields, the message will be managed or not by uh, the radio stack, okay? Meaning that you can send a message, but if you make some mistake in setting these fields, the message may not be received, okay? So you have to be careful here on what you're doing. It's not like TinyOS that you just specify the destination address and that's it, okay? Here you have also to go into the frame and specify the, the, the specific bits. Then for using the radio is basically easy because you just have a radio object and the radio object, sorry, the radio class basically exposes some methods like start receiving, stop receiving, transmit, set the callback for reception, so what happens when a message is, is received, set the channel, frequencies channel, set the short address of the mode, and all these kind of uh, methods that you can use to implement several functionalities, okay? Again, as usual, best way to learn it, see an, we, we see an example, okay? An example is radio count. So two modes that exchange messages and will turn on less depending on the the ED that they have received, okay? Let's see it very, very quickly. Again, let me close this. Let me go again to radio count. Okay, again, the Java file. So the class radio count, um, the important thing here is that I have this byte array, and as you can imagine, this byte array is my message, okay? So it's an array of bytes, and each byte represents a particular field in the 8.2.15.4 frame, okay? So just to see quickly what I do, I create the new radio object, just as like I created a new timer object. Then I open the radio, and I set the, the personal area network to this particular value here. Okay? I will also get my extended address here. Do you remember when I type mode create in the mode runner shell that a code appeared, that is the MAC address which is randomly generated by the simulation, and by calling mode.getParam I basically retrieve this long string and I set 
the short address of my mode by using basically the last two bytes of this big string. So I'm using basically short addresses. Then I have to prepare, I, here I will prepare a beacon, okay? So I will create a seven bytes array. Why seven bytes? Well, because if you look at the frame here, I just need one, two, three, then what? I'm using uh, source addressing, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, okay? And six, seven, okay? For source and source PAN and source address, okay? So seven bytes, I'm, I'm not using destination addresses. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? Seven bytes. And here we'll start filling the, the fields with the value that I need, okay? So I will uh, set the source address to my pen, pan ed and the source address of my network to this particular value here. Then I put the radio in, in receive mode, so I will use the handler and just as like as the blink example I will specify what, you, what is the function that has to be executed when a message is received, so the callback basically on rxpdu. So when I receive a message I will execute this function here on rxpdu which as you can imagine contains the message which is arrived I will check what is this message and I will take the second byte of my so, sorry the third byte of my receive message and I will set the state of the LEDs depending on what I have received okay I won't enter into these details you can check them so um, I, so here I um, set the callback, here I put the radio on receive mode, okay? And then I will both be receiving and then I have a timer will periodically will transmit a message to other nodes, okay? Just as the example in TinyOS, so the node is both receiving from other nodes and transmitting to other nodes. In this case, the timer will uh, execute the function periodic send, okay, every 2.5 seconds. And the periodic send function, what it's doing is transmitting basically my message, okay. Now, if you read the Motrunner documentation, you will see what is the purpose of all these parameters, okay. Basically, is okay transmit as soon as possible, use CCA, so listen a little bit before transmitting to see if the channel is busy or not, transmit this variable, which is my, my array, it's a, it's a seven bytes array, okay? And then I set again another alarm to be, to be fired. Very good, so let's try to test it. Um, in this case, what I will do I will start a Motrunner shell. I will create two two modes, so I will pass the number two. You see, I have now two different modes which are created, and if I look at in the dashboard, I have two modes. And then I type MoMA load radio count minus java minus 1.0 now if I just type this it will mo the MoMA will load these assemblies on both nodes I can also pass a different assembly to each different node by referring to its math address basically okay so I can decide what assembly to put on what modes I load it and of course here I will start seeing that they are basically um, sending messages and receiving messages 
and if you go on net view here you will see some activity now they are both on zero zero so they will be yeah as you can see you will have some information here on the fact that messages are exchanged okay so you have basically the FCF the flags of the message and type B which is beacon and the sequence number which is increasing okay why it's increasing well because in when I prepare the message I increase the count the counter and I fill the, the value according to it okay so you have uh, let's say representation of what is going on in your simulation here okay very good now last uh, thing which is the logger um, I can use the dashboard to show debug statements okay so in order to do this I have to compile my application by importing another package and if you remember in the tool chain I have to specify that I want to compile my application by using another functionality which is the logger functionality so to show a message I have basically to write these uh, three lines of code here just as like in TinyOS I have different debug channels that I can use so I have the info error warning debug okay I can decide on which channel to output uh, messages and well basically I can print whatever I want here I just specify you know, the, the statement that I want to print when I want to compile my assembly with logger functionalities I have to append this option at the end meaning that I want to compile my assembly using the functionality, functionalities which are compiled by this other assembly and of course I have to load not only my assembly on the mode but also the assembly that provides this functionality which is the logger one so what I will do now I will take take the first, ex first example, the light example, which is very very simple and I will modify it by putting some print statement, okay? So let's go in here, close this, clear a little bit, go on light and open the light.java file okay so I have to import what was the name Saguaro Logger okay then before uh, this I do like So this is uh, a method that convert strings to a byte array basically because you can't use strings if you remember on Motrunner. Uh, so string to byte, let's say hello IoT. Okay, then I have to call the logger dot append string and I have to put message here right and then I have to specify on which channel I want to output here and let's say it's mode dot info okay I save okay try to compile it assembly it's equal light minus now it's version 2 let's say 2.0 okay I have to also say that I want as external dependencies the logger and in this case is 11 the 11 versions since this is beta 11 right and then of course light object Okay, there's an error. What did I do? 
Ah, yes. Um, sorry. Probably I didn't put it into the static initializer, right? Exactly. Let's put this kind of stuff here. happened ah, okay. Okay. so it's compiling <clears throat> okay compilation successful now again let me open the motrunner shell It was cleared. Uh, we'll create one mode. Then I have to load the logger assembly. So MoMA load logger man, which is the one that will be used by my application to print statements. And then I will load the light minus 2.0 assembly. Okay, and as you can see, I have printed something here, hello IoT, and also here, if you go on the top left corner, you see all the messages that are coming from the simulation, and there should be also hello IoT here somewhere. Where is it? Hello IoT. Here you can select which channel you want to see. In this case, info channel. Okay. So you can print, let's say, debug statements, and Motrunner will, you know, show it to you. It will show what is the mode that has printed these statements, what is the message, and this kind of stuff. Okay. I guess that's all for today. Any questions? So, of course, uh, it seems very uh, powerful. Um, of course, it has a cost, meaning that it's not that, I, I guess it's not that efficient as TinyOS or other systems are. But uh, from the, let's say, application developer point of view, it's seem to be very very powerful okay and I guess that was the the initial purpose of IBM so to create a, a powerful development environment for wireless sensor networks okay so that that was probably the main uh, driving uh, driving factor and of course it's it's not very stable so unless Tinyo has which is very well documented you can find a lot of examples a lot of people were working on it Motrunner is still quite buggy so many functionalities are not implemented very well sometimes we have bugs uh, documentation is quite scarce i would say with respect to Tinyo has mm. that's why i think it's worthwhile seeing it because it's different from Tinyo has it takes a different approach but at the end, I don't know how useful it is for developing real applications, okay? So probably TinyOS and as we will see, Contiki are, are more, uh, let's say, robust and, and, and useful for that. Okay, very good. So that's all for today. We will continue next week, okay, with Contiki. <laughs>